When the original Final Fantasy VII came out in 2020 for the PlayStation 4, it was met with such critical acclaim that the Final Fantasy fanbase demanded it get remade. The sales were so high they broke records and the pressure from the fans was so great that Square Enix developed an elaborate Skynet-like time machine using their amassed NFT wealth and sent Hetsuya Nomura back in time to plant the idea in Hironobu Sakaguchi's head, who then went on to collaborate with the LEGO company and the rest is history. Which is why when we play the 2020 version we all remember parts of it, except for the parts that were bad and didn't exist, like the cloak people, because Sakaguchi had good taste. Jokes about cloaks aside, it's not hard to imagine why the game did so well. With such iconic characters like spiky-haired Clorb, the intense Barrel, the enchanting Teat, who you know is a bombshell because when you were nine years old you looked at the instruction manual that came with the game and decided Nice. Also, blood type B for booby. Tackling themes more relevant than ever, such as preventing the total annihilation of our planet through corporate greed, running away from the police, mental instability, lots and lots of mental instability, and brought to you by Andrew Tate himself, Invisible Alpha, a super drink for semen. The plot is something to behold, and if you like bombs, oh, let me tell you, you are a merc for avalanche, proud terror eco-warriors trying to put an end to the tyrannical hold the Shinra Electric Power Company has over the city of Midgar and the world. The Mako reactors milk goop from the planet to make electricity, which is making it become unalive. This upsets Barrel and his team of Jihad eco-warriors, Jesse, and the two who are named after Star Wars characters, Biggs and Porkins. Porkins says things like, Clob never came, but the truth is he never stopped. And Barrel says things like, open parentheses, asterisks, up thingy, percentage, exclamation mark. Biggs is cool because if you examine him when he's close to the screen, he looks like John Rambo. And Jesse just wants to blow things up and show you sick videos on YouTube. Me? Gungaga. The plot thickens after Clob does things like falls to his death and then meets Eris, who we name, I'm gonna die, the flower girl. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm Clob. <laughs> You see, you are relentlessly pursuing the Shinra Electric Power Company and the seemingly untouchable President Shinra to stop them before they destroy the planet. You stop at nothing, except for that one time you go to the Honeybee Inn where a worker calls you Poo, where 10 men in Speedos learn that you are the intimate type, Bubby, then hop in a hot tub with you. Feels good, huh? <laughs> no, it hurts! <laughs> you then cross-dress. But, you know, other than those things, you, you relentlessly pursue Shinra, you do. They commit terrible acts to stop you, such as crushing a suburb, and you can't stop them because Reno tells you, I can't have you do that. No one get in the way of Reno and the Turks. A line almost as iconic and memorable as, this guy are sick. Except in very Bethesda-like fashion, the multitude of additions that preceded the original PlayStation 1 game were patched to not be like this, instead giving us a legible localization of the original Japanese dialogue, which also had memorable lines, such as, Nandayo, Nani, and and Nandesuka. Anyways, we proceed to shoot Reno with Barrel's sick gun arm, fail anyway, panic, and escape the suburb crushing just in time. Sadly, Shinra has stolen Gonna Die, so you go to Gonna Die's mum's house, where she tells you how she adopted Gonna Die from a woman whose last words were, please take Gonna Die somewhere <laughs> So you bust into the Shinra HQ where you tell Barrel he's giving you the willies, flush the toilet, and discover that they're trying to make this dog thing breed with Gunna Die. But it turns out dog thing was good all along, and his name was Red 13 being that he is a lab specimen, which means nothing to him. He tells us we can call him what we wish. Your name's Table. By this point, you know that President Shinra and his organization are sick and pure evil to the core. So when you storm the Shinra HQ, climb all 70 of its floors, and get jump scared by the booby alien, and then arrested, you start to feel as if there's no beating them. That is, until you fall asleep in your cell that you are sharing with the hot polygon, completely clear of intrusive thoughts because you're on that Sigma male grind set, and you wake up with your cell door open. You follow the blood trails upstairs and discover President Shinra dead with a sword in his back. Someone has done your job for you and killed an untouchable man, but has spared a man who shares both name and uncanny resemblance with Australian political icon Clive Palmer, famous for various political stances, such as fatty. He tells us that it was Sephiroth who did this, and that's our introduction to the big bad in the game. You see, the original Final Fantasy VII for the PlayStation 1 introduced them properly. There was none of this weird flashback, hallucination, wet dream shit going on. Slowly. Silently. Uh, uh, gonna silently bust. <laughs> In the PlayStation 1 version, Sephiroth gets a proper John Wick introduction. He is the boogeyman who kills the boogeyman. The guy who slaughtered every person in the building, opened your cells, and left behind the blood trail. One man. You are made aware of this immensely powerful being who does effortlessly the things that take you great effort, and you haven't even seen him yet. For the first time player playing the 2020 release, you're afraid of Sephiroth without context, but in the 1997 version, you're told why you're afraid of him. Obviously, this is where I make the point that the 97 version is kind of mandatory for you to get to know all the story beats in the 2020 
2020 release, but I digress. This is about the time travel version. Clorp tells Barrel that this is the real crisis of the planet. Barrel then looks at a coin on the floor, fight the president's son and kill his dog. Then Yowza steal this Harley Daytona and play the motorbike minigame by holding down the attack button because the AI is too afraid to approach due to the unholy girth of the Buster Sword. You gather just outside of Midgar and decide to travel northeast to a town called Calm to discuss. And it's at this point in the 2020 release where you finish the whole game. And in this one, you're only four hours in and you're suddenly hit with the feeling of, oh wow, where do I go next? It's wild. You encounter a robot thing. It drone strikes you. Cloud does a spinny dance, and now you can drone strike everyone else, which is what you will be using exclusively in battles for the next five to 10 hours in game. You travel the countryside. You need to make your way across this lake without the immensely powerful snake thing effortlessly killing you. So you exterminate these emus and you catch a chicken. It's fast enough to take you across the lake in time, but then you get off it and walk across the lake anyway, because when you were nine, you told your friends that you did this and none of them believed you. And now you've captured proof that you did and you have done it. Even though your credibility was irredeemably destroyed because back then you also told them you turned on voice acting with a setting in the option menu, forever ruining their trust in you because you so obviously lied. And the Midgar Zolom you went to all this effort to avoid, one of them is absolutely obliterated and impaled by Sephiroth for all to see. And this makes you think, Oh boy, this guy is the real deal. There's this native man living in a hollowed out mountain who when you talk to him, he spins around way too far and doesn't look at you. There's this child called Yuffie that you find wandering around in the woods at random. And if you commit war crimes against her, giving her third degree burns and then a mean and sarcastic to her, she joins your party. She is absolutely not part of the dating mechanics in the game because if you look at the instruction manual, you'll see that if you pick her, you'll go straight to jail. For a lot of people, she's actually their favorite girl in the game and you can see why. She's fun, goofy, but still, believe it or not, straight to jail. I'm a child! Nice to meet you! <laughs> you perform CPR on a totally different child, ride a dolphin, impersonate an officer of the law, get confused with the button prompts, I don't know what the switch button is, and you travel the ocean where you get to see Barrel as a marshmallow, a scientist bathing in the sun in a full lab coat, stand in front of this guy in the water and watch him fight for his life, and then commit various acts of animal cruelty because Cloud is a being of pure unbridled chaos, and every individual you encounter must suffer by your presence, so help me Genova. And speaking of Genova, our travels through the coral mountains are calm and serene enough that we get to collect our thoughts and think about the journey so far, about how Genova is Sephiroth's mum and how he destroyed an entire town in that propane barbecue explosion and then T-pose for dominance in front of Clorb. So if I have this right, up until now, we are after Sephiroth because he's bad and he's going to the Promised Land. And Shinra is following him because Sephiroth can lead them to the Promised Land, which they've been looking for for decades, so that they can make a suck on it for electricity. Barrel gets punched and tells you why his arm is a gun. Nah, shit, my arm. Better build a fucking robot gun <laughs> to shoot people with. Barrel runs off. You pursue him but encounter a character that when I was nine years old, I named Fat Ass in all capitals. One day, my nan walked into my room and saw fat ass. Being the God-fearing good Catholic woman she is, she was deeply concerned by this. So today I've gone with big thing instead. People are going missing in the casino, all shot. Oh no. We know a guy who shoots things. We're arrested and thrown into a desert prison which is beneath the casino. I mean really, how dystopian is that? A casino with his own Alcatraz-like desert prison. Barrel executes this guy hiding behind a couch and then tells us he's innocent and didn't kill the people in the casino. We all just believe him. It was this white fool who did it. He shoots at Barrel, and it doesn't do anything. And then we shoot at him. The game explores themes of dealing with grief in the millennial way. We ride a chicken for our freedom, and cheat to restore our stamina by holding down the controller shoulder buttons. We take Table home, but his name isn't actually Table, I can't believe it. We traverse the cavern of daddy issues and look at Seto's Seto, his Seto. It's actually really quite touching, I'm doing this whole arc a massive disservice. We meet exciting characters like a guy in a box. We irritate him for a long time to get him to reveal to us that his name is D -D Daddy for reasons yet to be explained in game, wink wink. He also uses a gun, so now we're a firing squad. He's just trying to get back up the chain. <laughs> we keep shooting him. We go to Rocket Town. It has a rocket in the town. That's why it's called this. An old man gives us a sword as a reward for looking at his rocket with him. A sword that thrives when it feels the life force of all your friends fade as they die, literally. It does more damage the more people in your party are dead. So now you deliberately knock off your boys to eliminate your enemies. We meet Sid, but we name him Shira because his wife is called Shira and it's very amusing to see him call himself a dumbass. He constantly, openly, verbally abuses her. I can only imagine what goes on when he isn't entertaining guests. Anyway, he tells us we can't take 
make his plane, so we sit down to drink some goddamn tea. Australian political icon Clive Palmer, famous for various political stances such as fatty, walks in and asks for some tea, with sugar, honey and lard in it. Then we go to steal the plane anyway and kick the shit out of Australian political icon Clive Palmer, famous for various political stances such as fatty. We fly away and learn that the person Sid abuses isn't actually his wife, and we're left to conclude that this woman is probably serving some kind of life debt as an indentured slave who does all of his housework for him. Anyway, it gets wilder. We go back to the casino and discuss what happened on our journey so far. The Steam version of the game has the dialogue corrected, but it's at this point where Tifa claims in the original that she has no idea what a black cape is. She's a big idiot. And due to the various choices we've made in the dialogue up until this point, the background dating mechanic in the game has selected Barrel for our romantic night out. I absolutely did not do this deliberately, even though he is obviously the best choice, the most muscular the most passionate. Just think of the kind of arm attachments he can put on there. The first part of the date when you're with T to one of the others is to be part of the play because you're the hundredth couple who walked in. We try to do this but we're told we're not the hundredth couple because in 1997 being gay wasn't invented yet. We ride the gondola with Barrel. He asks us why we didn't choose someone else and it's the greatest dialogue in the game. Have a look. Hey Spikehead, why did you want to see fireworks with me for? You should have asked one of them. <laughs> also I've just noticed that Barrel has a thumb on his arm nub. <laughs> Uh, which were you have asked? Oh man, there just ain't no choice. T gonna die? Uh, a child? <laughs> Anyway, the reason we're here is to secure the keystone so that we can open the Temple of the Ancients and retrieve the ultimate destructive magic before Sephiroth and Genova can. To do this, we fight in the arena and are instantly destroyed by a tiny frog who turns us into a frog and then into stone. This game really is amazing. We are given the keystone out of pity. We go to the Temple of the Ancients, taking Sid with us because Sid has a spear making him the coolest character in the game. You see, in Final Fantasy, people with spears like to jump, and his limit breaks are simply him jumping higher and higher each time. He probably wanted to ride the rocket in Rocket Town to the moon so he could jump off it, which would be the highest jump in history. God, I wish I was him. In the temple, we encounter this thing. When I was a kid, I played this game on a tiny screen, so I thought this thing was its head, and this thing was like one of those South African neck elongation thingies. But on closer inspection, it's just a black mage type creature from the earlier games, and now my immersion is destroyed and my day is ruined. Anyway, we struggle through the temple, at some points being a team of entirely frogs. You do this really charming clock puzzle, which is simultaneously really frustrating like half of the time. Then do this enchanting Scooby-Doo chase sequence, but the ancient in all its wisdom absolutely destroys itself by going through the same cavern I did like a proper numpty. Claw trips balls and then we fight a spooky wall. And we're supposed to feel sad while this rodent kills itself while collecting the black materia being crushed to death in the temple. Fortunately, Square knew how to regulate its players emotionally back then and we're immediately thrown into a cutscene where Claw goes full MMA ground pound on Gonna Die. He then gives the black materia to Sephiroth despite baby Claw's best efforts. Now, this all looks pretty out there and believe me it is, but the game explores themes in a multitude of actually very compelling metaphorical ways. For example, ever had a dream where your punches are slow and soft or you're incapable of running very fast? These are all feelings represented visually in the game, which is absolutely a product of its time, but also artistically perfect for what it was trying to achieve. We wake up to the vision of Barrel and Teat looking over us. Our dream is revealed to us that Gunna Die is in an ancient city and Sephiroth is following her. We travel reliably on a shot down aircraft across the ocean to a giant dinosaur skeleton, which is, which is obviously the place, right? We find the forest, but we cannot get through without the Lunar Harp. Fortunately, the Lunar Harp is buried right beneath our feet. So we hire a group of purple green loot goblins to dig for us, and now we found it. Mushroom Kingdom, here we come! I've played this before, so I know for a fact that I'm meant to be here, but Nemo is in the way, so I get confused and run around for a bit. We spend the night after running around and return to find Nemo has been taken to 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney, revealing a staircase. By now, Clorb knows something's up, so Clorb gets a sword out and does a wiggle, but then accidentally tries to team kill Gonna Die, but it was simply a misinput. Unfortunately, Sephiroth, and now Gonna Die is dead, although I can't say we're surprised because she had forewarned us a few times. When I was a wee lad, I was crying like a baby at this. Unlike right now, where I am not crying. Not crying at the nostalgia. Not crying at the loss. Not crying at the music that persists through to the boss battle. Not crying at Clorb confessing he doesn't want to continue. And because we're not crying, the devs understand that we're all having a good time. So they immediately send us to a town where we end up snowboarding and having a blast with absolutely no thought to our dear friend who gonna died 10 minutes ago.
Now it's personal. We pour all of our energies into stealing this airship and fly to the northern crater of the planet to kick Sephiroth's ass. I understand I'm glossing over the entirety of Disc 2, but that's basically the gist of it. To the new player, this is an epic journey down to the center of the planet, but to the rest of us, we're here to beat up Sephiroth's mum, Genova, who has turned into a huge testicle beast. In the final moments before the battle, we're getting ready to hear the iconic music and see the angelic man, but instead we see a big fish. It's, ju it's just a huge fish. I want to see the remake give us fish man. That's what I want. Bizarro Sephiroth is straightforward. What you have to do is kill his body parts, but mostly the big yellow groin area, which is his nucleus, the powerhouse of the cell. The game keeps asking you if you care about the other party members, and we will always respond with nah. We kill fish, and then it's existential huge final battle time. Sephiroth destroys the whole solar system, except it's not the game's solar system, it's ours in real life. And he wins. He always wins. JK, we hurt him and he explodes for 10 minutes. Then there's one last mental breakdown, and we go for round three. We tunnel through space and time to lick the sweat from Sephiroth's exposed abs. The remake makes this whole sequence super cool, one of the most entertaining and well choreographed cutscenes in video game history. But the original game, it just oozes existential riz. Check this out. <laughs> A huge thank you to the patrons. If I'm Barrel, you're my gun arm that allows me to shoot people for no reason. Thank you for supporting me, you're the best. Join our Discord from the link below and abuse our moderator who tried the original Final Fantasy VII but didn't finish it because, and I quote, you were so irritating that I no longer wanted to play it anymore. Follow the socials, give the video a like, and please, please, please send it to anyone you think may enjoy. So long, honeys. I love you. Mwah. <laughs>